And I did want to just kind of start today by acknowledging the pain that so many people are feeling in our community and around the world uh, around, you know, racial violence. And it feels a little disingenuous to have a program like this that's operating totally outside of the context of what's going on in our society. Um, maybe we can look at it as a sort of escapism, but I do want to sort of acknowledge that and let you know that we are all thinking about what's going on and thinking about what we can do as a museum and as an education department to help create a more equitable future. Um, so I wanted to just, just say that. Um, I also wanted to offer a disclaimer that I am not a food historian. So uh, <laughs> we will be going through paintings looking at food, but if you've got questions like, well, where did the apple originate from or how did it get to Europe in the 17th century? I cannot answer any of that, but I am good at art history and I'm good at eating. So we'll focus on those two things <laughs> instead. Um, so hopefully you got my email yesterday and you've prepared a couple of snacks or fun, fun bites to, oh, okay, yeah, Mary's got the wine. <laughs> um, so what we'll do is I'm going to share my screen and then we will just jump right in. I've got five paintings today that I want to um, share with you. So here we go. Back to your original comment about what's happening these days, mm -hmm. uh, let me just mention listen to your art chat with a doctor, everyone should listen to it. It was fabulous. Yeah, yeah. Lisa Merritt is actually one of our board members. Um, if you haven't seen it, we had a conversation with her about sort of racial inequities and disparities in healthcare and in society. Um, and she is a, she's a firecracker. I mean, she is on the front lines trying to make things better. So she is wonderful. And it was really, it was fun to talk to her. So thank you, Ingrid. I appreciate that. Okay. So that all being said, let's jump in. Um, I'll have you just keep yourselves on mute um, as a default, but I, you know me, I want this to be a conversation. I wanna hear your questions and your comments and your responses. So at any point, please feel free to unmute. Um, and we'll also have Kay and Kathleen sort of monitoring the chat box, but just feel like you can jump right in. It's, it's probably best if you just unmute and say what you wanna say. So here's our first painting uh, today. So I've asked you for the first stop to prepare something non-edible but a fancy place setting and I think you can see why it's reflected um, in this incredibly elaborate and ornate banquet scene. So I have um, a crystal goblet filled with water um, that I got for my wedding many years ago. Well, not that many years ago, like five years ago. Um, so this is my fancy uh, place setting but I'm curious what you all have. So if anyone wants to uh, unmute and kind of hold up or let us know what you've got and I think you'll have to have unmute so that you show up. <laughs> Ingrid, what is that? Is, is that? is that purple? It is. It's a very fancy martini glass. And <laughs> it even, it's called Purple Haze. And I have to look for Ingrid. Is a recipe for a Purple Haze martini. Cool. All right. Very fancy. I like that. All right. What, who, else, who else has something fancy place setting? I do. I don't, this is not fancy. It's just, it's a, an old, I collect old glass. So this is an old, one of my collection of old glasses. Oh, beautiful. I and like I actually that. use it more for water than for wine, yeah. but I've got the wine. <laughs> well, there you go. Win, win. Yes, I, indeed. You have, you have something too, right? Yes. This, this is from my great, great grandparents. And it's, oh, that's wet. beautiful. Can you see, I don't know. I, don't, I can't Hold see. It up a little, oh, there you go. Perfect. It's elaborately carved napkin rings. Wow. And what is the decoration on there? It's hard for us to make that out. It's Chinese. If you look at it, it is, oops, I can't seem to get it in the camera. <laughs> but you have it there a moment. If you look at it, it's Chinese. Uh, it's a very elaborate Chinese carvings. Is it ivory? Yeah, it looks I like I think it is. Back then it wasn't a no-no, and then there are initials. <laughs> Wow, those are really right. cool. Exactly. Yeah. I have some letter openers. So you could never buy them today. <laughs> <laughs> and it looks like Ed and Annette, you've got, um, let's see, let me give some, like, what have you got there? Crystal. Crystal and a pretty napkin. And it's just got some woven in the thread on it. Beautiful. And yeah, it's a little hard to hear your audio, but we can see, um, we can see your audio. We have a crystal, uh, a little champagne glass champagne. Uh, here, and we have a rolling napkin ring right, uh, right here. I love it. Beautiful. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I brought crystal too. <laughs> yeah. 
So we have, this is Irish crystal, it's Waterford. And every woman in my family for generations always gets the exact same pattern. So <laughs> a little bit of meaning to it. I love that. And Anyone Kathleen, you're that? waving it around like that? Yes. Yeah, be I careful, know. Kathleen. <laughs> <laughs> proud, proud and Irish. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> Anyone else want to share? Hi, can you hear me? I can hear yes, you. Hey. Yes. I Hey, and I don't know whether you can see the glass, but I always love to cook. And so before I ever got out of college, I bought silverware. But these, this glass was originally a dollar. And it's wow. red. Wow. <laughs> so I could entertain and, you know, make it cute. <laughs> <laughs> well, the cook always needs a glass of wine. But yes, ma'am. <laughs> While cooking. <laughs> So with your, with your fancy accoutrement in hand, let's turn now to look at this painting here. Um, some of the things we're holding up sort of seem like they're reflected in this fancy place setting. Um, so take a moment to look at this painting. Uh, if you haven't spent much time with it, it's sort of hanging high in the wall in gallery, oh gosh, I don't remember the number, but one of the smaller galleries and it's easy to sort of miss. Um, but I want you to just take a moment and, and tell me what's going on here and who do you think these people might be based on the contextual clues the artist is giving us? Ingrid, I know you know this painting very well. <laughs> so, yeah. I love this painting. Um, I use it in my tours quite frequently. It's, it's such an enigma. You can never tell by looking who the people are because in your wildest imaginings, would you ever guess who these people are supposed to be? So but let's put that to the test. Does anyone, does anyone have a guess if you are not as familiar with this painting about who these people might be? Well, from Ingrid's comment, obviously they're not whom they look as though they are. <laughs> <laughs> who do you think they look as though they are? Well, certainly the lady in green looks very regal. Mm -hmm. Uh, and she is obviously being toasted or visited by some kind of an angel, and I'm not strong on angels. Um, and I would say from uh, the ornamentation of everything, it's probably, ooh, 15th, 1500s, 1600s. It looks European, but now you're probably going to say that it's little girls from New York dressed up to look like princesses. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, I'll end the suspense for you. I do have the, um, the, oops, the information here for you. So this is a scene um, from the, the banquet of Anthony and, Anthony and Cleopatra. And it is European. It's by a French artist, Claude Vignon, um, around, you know, mid 1600s. And it tells this really incredible, what is probably apocryphal story, um, but it's so great, I wanna share it with you now. So basically the story goes that uh, Antony and Cleopatra had a rivalry and they were um, going back and forth about who could throw the most elaborate banquet, who could be the most excessive um, and sort of ornate. Uh, so what you see here is Antony has um, set the table all of the plates and the vessels are pure gold. There's all sorts of beautiful things to eat and drink. Um, and so he's, he's feeling pretty confident that he's outdone Cleopatra. She shows up with really nothing prepared. Um, but what is happening in this moment is, and I think I've got a close up of it. If you look very closely at the bottom, she has removed one of her pearl earrings and she puts it into a goblet of vinegar, lets it dissolve and then drinks it. And in doing so um, demonstrates that you know, she has no need to uh, hold on to material wealth because she has so much of it. And in that way, sort of demonstrates the ultimate in excess uh, and, and wins the contest. So that's what you see here um, happening in this moment. So now knowing that story, um, is there anything new that kind of you're noticing in this scene or do you have sort of a new interpretation of this painting? I've always wondered with Anthony holding his hand out, this is obviously the, um, the combination of both banquets in the, that are mentioned in, in the writing. Um, but we see Cleopatra holding the pearl in her, right, in her right hand, the goblet is above, and there's Anthony with his hand held out. And the question then becomes, what is he saying with holding out his hand? 
I give. You don't have to destroy that beautiful pearl earring. Or is he perhaps saying, no, stop, I want to win. I'm a guy, I have to win. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's a good point. That's sort of an ambiguous gesture there, what that hand means in his facial expression as well. Any, anything else that people are noticing or in, in what ways does this painting sort of play with the idea of excess and elaborateness for you? Well, I may be wrong, but it seems as though the artist has put them in the excessive dress of his own country. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think that Cleopatra would be dressed like this in her own country. Anthony, sort of, mm -hmm. but she and uh, the others around her don't are not dressed in Yeah, no, that's a great point. That's not exactly what we think of when we think of Cleopatra and sort of Egyptian royalty in ancient times, absolutely. But Anthony's at the same garb time, is more right, is more yeah, correct. Yeah, and I love, I mean, if you look really closely, there's, there are jewels everywhere and her headpiece, and then even the attendants are so elaborately dressed, and they've got beautiful headdresses as well. Um, yeah, well, I, I think, oh, well, sorry, just to add a point, I think if they were at home, yes, she would be wearing jewels, but maybe the artist felt that viewers wouldn't recognize how regal she was if he put her in her own costume. So he's transferred her and her attendants into European garb so people understand how regal she is. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great point. Could be. Seems almost a parody. And what you really miss by just looking at this painting on the screen is if you look at it in person and stand underneath the painting and look up at its surface, the gold is applied so thickly to that painting that it literally pops off the canvas. Uh, you can see it just uh, laid thickly on the canvas. It must have been extraordinarily expensive to produce that painting since they used real gold in the paint. But the fossils and the curtains at the top, all of the tableware um, have real three-dimensionality because of the just gobs and gobs of gold that was applied to this painting. Yeah, I love, and so you'll have to all go see this in person. I wish I could remember which gallery it was in. It's on the, uh, the North Wing. Um, but yeah, the way that the artist has handled the paint is so unique. And this is really, um, really kind of uh, unique to Vignon, the artist. Uh, and Virginia Brilliant, the former curator, wrote about this painting in her catalog. And I just wanted to quote the way she describes his style because it's, it sums it up so well. Uh, his early dis dis style she describes as insouciant, flamboyant, and theatrical. And then she says later he developed an eclectic original style all his own. This includes thick encrusted impasto, or that very thick paint that Ingrid was mentioning, shot through with golden highlights and brilliant colors shown in unusual combinations. Um, so this painting is very unique and this artist really did have a style all of his own. Um, and I think it, that style that he was working in is so fitting for a story like this, for a narrative like this. Um, it's a really fun one. I did want to show you, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, I understand his father was uh, earned his living by making tableware for royal households. So the painting could literally be a page from the catalog. <laughs> yes, yeah. So his father uh, produced, um, you know, silver and gold ware for the royal courts of France. Um, so certainly this artist was well versed in all of these beautiful vessels. And, um, you know, these probably are very accurate representations of what kinds of things would have been used in the, the royal court. Because we're talking about food, I wanted to just show you a few close-ups of what's on the table. And it's sort of hard to make out because really the food here is not the emphasis of the banquet. But to me, it looks like there's some grapes here and I cannot figure out what these are. They almost look like a pile of maggots, which I know would not be at a banquet like this. <laughs> so any, any guesses on what that is? I really don't know. Mm -mm. Well, we can assume something fancy. And then as we move over on the other side, What's interesting too is that almost the way that the paint is applied in these instances is, has become almost translucent, which is interesting considering how thickly he applies paint in other areas. Um, so really, I think the food is not the emphasis, like we said, um, of this painting. It is not given that sort of um, weight uh, in, with the artist's attention. But nonetheless, uh, interesting. I don't know if that's, those are some sort of fruits or something. Um, but I hope I've whet your appetite. So we'll, any last comments or questions about this before we, we start with the eating? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so
So we, we've set the stage or we've set the table, so let's dig in. So our next painting is all about the food, um, less so maybe about the, the place setting, and we can talk about that in just a little bit. But uh, as you look at this painting, what foods can you identify here and which ones are the most appealing or seem the most delicious to you? I'm still seeing the banquet. Oh, it didn't, my, my screen didn't advance? You did. It did. It did. Yeah, no, I see it. Is everyone looking at a new painting? Okay. Yep, yep. yep. So what do you, anything, anything rec recognizable in this scene to you that's still, still something we might eat today? Beautiful pears. Yes. Beautiful pears up at the top. Yeah. It always reminds me of like a still life, you know, when people do little still life paintings and like art class, those pears to me just seem so perfectly rendered. I see almonds. Oranges. Almonds. Oranges. Mm -hmm. Oranges over here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Quince. What was that? Quince. Oh, quince. These here? No. Uh, uh, above the... Uh, over here, right? Well, that she can't see it on the art. Uh, <laughs> uh, if you look at the white cone... Uh -huh. To the left of there, these here. A little further up, a little further up, yeah. up right there. This yes. quince. Oh. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. So the and this whole plate seems to be sort of like sugared fruits and other pastries. Um, yeah. So it's a little bit hard to make out, but yeah, probably a quince there would be great. And then this here um, in the foreground uh, is actually these are citrons, which are sort of like the early uh, relative of lemons. Of lemons, big. basically, yes. they're big and bumpy and kind of really beautiful. Yeah. Oh, I'm adds, curious. Oh, go ahead. You put them in, in fruit cake. You put the citrons? citrons? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you've ever seen like at Whole Foods, I know they have them, the, the Buddha fingers or Buddha hands, I think they're called, the really long ones with the, uh, they're sort of all long and bumpy. Those are really fun to look at too. So a lot of kind of maybe everyday food, but arranged really beautifully. So before we go any further, I'm curious, what, what food did you prepare for this stop? And I've got, I've got my trusty slice of apple here. Um, but I'm curious, does anyone have anything that they want to share? Fruit. Kay, Kay you've fruit. got, are those nuts? Almonds. Almonds, okay. Mary, you've got fruit. I've got an apple. Apple. Apple as well. Apple, uh, I just thought of this pun. Apple is sort of low-hanging fruit <laughs> for something like this, because we've mostly <laughs> all got apples in our cabinets, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Almonds and grapes. Almonds and grapes, okay. Did yeah. anyone, is anyone indulge in a sugar cube? No, but I see you've got a sugar cone up there. Yeah, yeah, so this cone, this white thing right here is an entire cone of pure white sugar. Um, and that cool. certainly would have been a luxury item back when this painting was made. Um, and so the, the date of this painting is about 1700 and it's by an Italian artist actually, Cristofaro Munari. Um, and it's just, I think it's just really, really beautiful um, in the way that it's arranged or the composition. And I've got a couple of close-ups because again, this is a tour all about food and eating. So those are the citrons, got the, the clementines or the mandarin oranges, the apples in the back. This here um, is sort of like toast and some flatbreads. These almost remind me of like lady fingers, but I'm not <laughs> sure entirely what those would be. Um, and then I've got another close-up here. Of the quince, the sugar. Or biscotti. Yeah. A biscotti could be a biscotti, especially if he's Italian, right? <laughs> and some pastries here. Um, but I want to think about the idea of balance in this composition. How is balance explored or represented in this painting? You've got two plates askew. Mm -hmm. yeah, they're kind of tilting. Here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, you've got your triangles, haven't you? And you have triangles. Say more about that. Where do you see the triangles? Uh, actually, with the pl with the plates, the biscotti plate, mm -hmm. going up to the quince plate, mm -hmm. coming back to the pastry plate, yes. Mm -hmm. And then you go up another layer, and you've got the pastry plate, the quince plate, going up to the pear plate. Ah, uh-huh. And then you've even got further down, I should have begun, with the, um, the citrons going towards the nuts, and then going up to the peeled apple. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Sort of a triangle here. Yeah. But it's really cool that he's used circles to, to be the objects, but connected them to triangles, if you want to look at triangles. 
Yes. Well, and I think you should Why always not? look for triangles. I think it's a good way to understand a composition. I think you started us on that. Yes, it's your fault. <laughs> yeah, and for me too, it's the sort of the literal balance about how these plates um, are sort of balanced precariously, especially the, the one with the pastries on these round, what seem to be apples, you know, they can go, just go rolling right out. Um, but then also balance, it's not a symmetrical composition entirely, but it feels very balanced, even though we have this area of just sort of dark, um, nothingness in the back corner. Um, the way your eye sort of comes up to the foreground and then continues around the composition, it just feels like there's some balance and rhythm in the way that he so carefully composed all of these items. Um, Could you answer a question which is not about the food? I'm sorry, Ingrid, you were breaking up a little bit. Can you say that again? I'm sorry. Uh, everything seems to lead up to the plate of pears. Even the yeah. sugar cone is pointing, in it, if you if you will, and mm -hmm. then it's so brightly lit. So yeah, the, yeah, the thinking about light really too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for you, it sort of all culminates here in this beautiful platter of pears, which also is probably somewhat precariously balanced on this other vessel. Um, and so Mary, you you had a question or a comment? I was actually going to ask about that. It looks absolutely beautiful. It looks like it's ceramic, mm -hmm. whereas the other one, the blue one, looks more kind of Turkish and it could be wood. But do you know what those would have had in them? These vessels here? Yes, they're beautiful. I'm not sure what they would have had in them. I think this one is meant to be a, a Chinese import. Um, okay. Munari was working um, in the same style of artists who were painting Chinese vessels, but then also Delftware. So that may be what this other one is. Oh, it could produced. be, yes. Um, it's you know, gorgeous. Kind of, yeah, no, they're really, really beautiful. Um, I didn't want to interrupt. Does anyone else have a, another comment before I... Okay. Um, yeah, no, and that's something that I wanted to think a little bit about too is these beautiful, like clearly fancy, elaborate vessels, um, and even, you know, st signs of status, right? The sugar cone itself and the beautiful pastries. Um, but then look at the, the setting on which it's all placed, especially if you look at the bottom foreground here, it's this sort of crumbling stone block. And even the, the slate um, on which some of the other things are placed seems to be sort of chipped and cracking. So I'm curious what you think uh, the significance of that is, and I don't have an answer for you, um, but why why have all of these beautiful luxury goods and then um, place them on something that seems a little bit shabby? Transference of life? Well, transience was that of life? The passage of life? Transience. Oh, the, transience. Uh, transience yeah. of life. Yeah. yeah. The, that nothing is going to endure. Well, Ed's comment is much deeper than mine. I would just say <laughs> <laughs> that by using very simple textured um, surfaces, they're not arguing with the beauty of the fruit or the porcelain that's in the rest of the artwork. Mm, mm -hmm. And the other thing, of course, is often artists would show different textures to let viewers know how good they were at creating those textures. Mm -hmm. So maybe he's doing that. I don't know, but it, he's really good at slate. He's really, he's really good at all of his textures. Yeah. He is, yeah. So I like that. So two different ideas. So perhaps one, just to sort of remind us that, you know, you can have beautifully polished things, um, but things are fragile. Life moves on. Life is transient. Um, these vessels might crack as the, you know, the foundation here has cracked. Um, and also maybe just letting the artist sort of show off his texture. And really the textures in this painting are amazing. It doesn't, the screen does not do it justice. So this is in gallery 13, if you want to go look at it in person. Um, and yeah, just really incredible. And, and it's sort of an interesting contrast, right, between the sort of perfection of what's presented on the platters and then the sort of, you know, less than perfect foundation on which it sits. I like that. But it's in the kitchen, it's and in the a lot kitchen. of people use slate to put cheese upon. And mm -hmm. maybe it was something that always sat there. Mm -hmm. So our cook, our resident cook has weighed in, Kay, who <laughs> spends a lot of time in the kitchen, says, well, maybe this is just the kitchen or the pantry, and the slate is something that's always there. And he's kind of capturing you know, a slice of life um, with, I think, very deliberately arranged items. But maybe this is what was there, and that's what he decided to paint. I like that, I like that theory as well. Um, one other question I've got for you. I think for something that is seemingly so straightforward and simple, it's just a still life, it's just food. Um, there's a lot of sort of mysteries about this painting. So one thing I wanted to ask too is why do you think he left this bowl empty? What is the significance of that? And again, I do not have the answer for you. So I'm curious to hear what you think. Well, that, that would, would go back to Ed's comment. 
So going back to Kay and Ed's comment and, and say more about that. The meaning of life and the fact that one bowl is empty. <laughs> so what, is that, what does it mean? What is the meaning of life, Mary? Oh, good Lord, question. that's a difficult <laughs> question, yes. <laughs> well, is, is that bowl the beginning or the end? Ah. Or yeah. maybe uh, filling it up. Maybe the food hasn't been filled yet. Yeah. Kay has yet to bake something to put in there. So, so perhaps is this the beginning or the end? Is this, are, are we just waiting for the next dish to be presented or has it been consumed and we're sort of on the, you know, the downward slope of consuming this feast could go either way. Anyone else have a, have a thought about what potentially the, the function of that empty bowl might be? It could just be the servants getting food ready to bring out yeah, to, the to the folks the in the fancy dining room. Mm -hmm. Is that bowl looks off. Yeah, it's sort of a, a, a work in progress, the moment before right. things He's are Right, he's going to load those, whatever those are, apples in the back into that mm -hmm. bowl. Could be, yeah, these apples here. Mm -hmm. so just another. servants coming in and carrying mm -hmm. these platters out. I like that theory. That may also sort of explain the haphazardness. I mean, I think compositionally, from an artistic standpoint, it's very deliberately arranged, but it has that sense of sort of, being, you know, slapped together and these bowls are about to fall over and everything's just kind of there ready to be presented more formally perhaps. So, and that's, I like that theory, that's interesting. But if it were full, it would be almost too much. So you need sort of a little moment of visual respite here where you don't have <laughs> something. Exactly. And what we, what we used to do in photography is you always go at least one or two steps too far and mm -hmm. then you back off. And you often realize that backing off is actually less is more. Less is more. That could be a good subtitle for this painting, although more is more. <laughs> I'm not sure more. about that. More is <laughs> more. Is more and... More is more. There you go. <laughs> and and, and th thinking about that sort of idea of visual respite or escape, I, I'm struck too by this indent in the, the surface here where we've seemed like we've almost approached it and we're standing right up against it, but then there's a space where we can kind of step forward. So there's a little bit of a void there as well, which I think is an interesting compositional choice. Um, I should say too, as we go through each painting, feel free to, you know, eat your apple or eat your nuts because this is your chance to, this is your one chance to eat while you're looking at works in the Ringling Collective. So we're not going to let you do it in the galleries. Um, so feel free to keep munching as we go. Um, any last comments or questions about this I'm, one? Ingrid, did I'm you just uh, vaguely when there was a spotlight done on this painting in our class and uh, Dan, I believe mentioned something uh, in the Jewish religion that for a particular holiday that it was traditional to leave an empty plate, but I don't recall exactly what the reason was. Elijah. Does that? And that's an empty cup for Elijah, right? Yeah, usually an empty cup. Yeah, so we, um, just to fill everyone in, uh, Ingrid was in one of my uh, docent training classes and we had a, a, a classmate, a fellow student who came up with this really wonderful and sort of off the wall theory that maybe this artist was secretly Jewish and this is an expression of his faith. Um, I think thinking about the different foods, you know, the unleavened bread like you might have around Passover, um, the sugar and the apples like you might have for Rosh Hashanah, um, thinking about the significance perhaps of the empty plate. So there's been no um, sort of scholarly research to, to back that up, um, but certainly an interesting theory and, and maybe, you know, supports the idea that this is a very mysterious painting for something that's seemingly a simple depiction of food. So I think we'll leave that one there. We'll go on to our next one, which is also a still life painting. You can also see in gal. Oh, and I've got a couple more close ups here. Um, I love because I love this detail of the knife too sticking out into our space, you know, to really bring it alive. And then I had to give you a close up of those, those pairs that everybody loves as well. Okay. Next one, again, and you know, this is one of our most um, ubiquitous works in the museum because there's so much to say about it and it fits with so many thematic tours, but I can't do a, a tour about food without talking about this one. <laughs> um, <laughs> so first of all, this is painting number three. What have you brought? Did anyone, was anyone brave enough to scrounge up something seafood related for this stop? <laughs> anyone have anything? Kathleen's got a can of tuna. <laughs> We have a can of tuna. These are clam shells. We're having stuffed clams for dinner tonight. Oh, stuffed clams. Wow, that's fancy. <laughs> I have 
I've got, sadly, I've got a little spoonful of leftover uh, tuna casserole, which is getting a little <laughs> fragrant at this point. Um, so certainly not fancy, but. <laughs> and we got lots of bagels in the refrigerator. <laughs> Weren't grapes one of your choices? Grapes were a good alternative. Does anyone have grapes? No, but I, I have blueberries. They're the same kind of I got round grapes. purplish fruit. I'll give you that, <laughs> Kay. That counts. <laughs> Fair enough. And you know what? Blueberries are pretty luxurious these days, too, to get some good fresh blueberries. So that, that works. Did anyone else have anything, anything else for this painting that they want to share? Just grapes. Grapes? OK. And your grapes, yeah. The, the grapes are featured right, right there in the center. Um, so let's take an inventory. I just want to walk you through some of the details. And again, I know it's not the same as being in the galleries, but there are some advantages to doing this on Zoom, which is I can show you some uh, details of the painting that you might not be able to get to um, right up close in the galleries. So we talked about seafood. Gorgeous. There are there's the lobster, um, of course, featured prominently, but then there are these little shrimp or prawns here that are easy to miss when you're looking in the gallery. Um, a beautifully peeled lemon. I mean, just look at the detail, the puckered, um, you know, sort of dimples on the rind, how it's um, you know, arranged so beautifully. And I love what this artist does with reflection onto the silver vessels. I mean, it almost looks like a photograph right here in this moment too. It's so, so beautifully finely rendered. Um, of course the lobster and you can see, it. I mean, I can almost smell the lobster, the, the way it's sort of, <laughs> I don't know what that is on, it, on the shell, but that kind of soft, wet texture. Um, there's the grapes. So, Mary and Kay, those, that's, that's your area there. Um, and oysters too. So as we're talking about seafood, kind of like clams. So same, same general idea. Um, and here, uh, the connotation with oysters probably would have been sort of like sexual appetite. So it sort of betokens indulgence um, by having them here. And I wanted to draw your attention again to the reflection here in this vessel, um, how beautiful it is. And you can see the orange and the oyster is kind of warped on the surface and even reflected in the cheek of this figure. Um, and then something that you may not notice when you're looking in the galleries, but this toppled uh, salt cellar or salt shaker. Um, so again, like in the other painting, we're seeing all these luxury items piled on top of each other, falling all over each other um, and sort of precariously balanced a little bit. Um, and I think I maybe have one more detail. Oh, the grapes. And then I think these are probably peaches and plums. There's a little bit of a cantaloupe down here as well. Um, so a feast for the senses, certainly. Um, but I want to ask you, as you look at this painting, besides it making you hungry, what is the mood of this piece for you? What sort of message are you getting from it? Exotic. Exotic. And why do you say exotic? I guess when we put together the parrot, the lobster, and the shells, uh, if you live anywhere other than in the tropics, it looks exotic for that time, for that period. Because yeah, those absolutely. are all really expensive things from very different places. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the parrot here, and there's actually a second parrot um, up at the top. He's kind of easy to miss, this African gray parrot, but from Africa. Oh, okay. uh, so another exotic element, if you will, even depending on ethnocentrism and where we're speaking from as a point of uh, beginning. But uh, yeah, so there's a Brazilian macaw, an African gray parrot, these big shells, um, even the lobster. Um, yeah, so for you, it feels like this, this amalgam of items that evoke exoticism. I love that. Very luxurious. And also the fabric on which they're sitting. Yeah, are you talking about the red fabric here, the drape? Yes, and the drapery is gorgeous too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a feeling of indulgence, perhaps. What other indulgence what other... and excessive. luxury? Yes. Excessive. Yeah, certainly excessive. Right over the top. Yep, over the top. Over the top. It's, it's what else? What other Storm words would you use? Confused and cacophonous, I think. Cacophonous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, confused and cacophonous. Confused. And say more about that. Well, there, there's a. Uh, almost a disorder about it. And it uh -huh. actually doesn't make me hungry. It's, I, I'm a little put off by it. Okay, so for you, it's not this sort of beautiful uh, feast, mm. uh, but this like it's a little, it's too yeah, much, you're a little put off by it. And not making any sense. Okay, and it doesn't seem to be arranged in a way that makes sense no. for you. Okay, yeah, no, absolutely. And if you look really closely, and I, I didn't include these details, um, but there are insects crawling throughout as well. Um, there are little caterpillars and moths and other, uh, I think, oh. grasshoppers. So, 
yeah, you, you're perhaps right to be put off because this food has been cracked open and has maybe been sitting out for a while and is maybe not so good to eat after all. Um, Kay, I think you were going to make a comment. Were you gonna... it, it, there's a storm brewing in the background. Mm, okay, so there's a storm brewing in the background. And what do you make of that? Maybe things aren't so good. <laughs> maybe things aren't so good, yeah. So you were right to be wary, I think, maybe, right? <laughs> Anyone else have sort of a thought about why there might be this sort of dramatic dark clouds set in the background, what that might mean? It's a really yeah. good balance with all the, the brightness and the, of, the, of the main subject. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point because it's, everything is so vibrant. The colors are so um, almost over the top, larger than life. And then you have this really dark um, upper section that's the black drapes and then the storm that kind of offsets it nicely. That's a good you point. need a rest. You need a, another rest for your eyes, yes. <laughs> and nothing lasts forever. And nothing lasts forever, right. So it's a good reminder, right? Uh, you know, the oysters are going to go bad after not too long. Uh, the fruit is going to start to rot. The birds are going to start picking at things. The lobster is going to start smelling. So you have all this luxury. I mean, you can celebrate it, but remember that it's fleeting, I think, is probably a good, a good message. So I've well, got to ask the, you all. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, at least the parrots are still alive. <laughs> yes, we have, the parrots are living. They're alive and well and probably That's about good. to be a good feast. Yeah. <laughs> so if this is sort of an assemblage of luxury goods from, um, you know, Dutch 17th, 17th century culture, what would you assemble? Uh, what are the luxury items you'd put together in a still life that represents life during COVID or life during quarantine? I'm going to start by saying toilet paper is a hot commodity. So I'm going to put <laughs> toilet paper in our collective still life. But what chocolate. else would you put in there? Chocolate. Chocolate, okay. We have toilet paper and chocolate. What else? Wine. Wine. Definitely wine. <laughs> Definitely wine. <laughs> and you, you, they do have some, um, a beautiful glass here, a couple of glasses of, of alcohol. So on the right track there. What else yeah. might you put in? Your computer and iPhone. Computer, iPhone, and I would say a good wireless connection because when that goes out, you are lost. <laughs> so I'm going to put my little wireless modem or router, whatever you'd call it, right smack in the middle, the center of all things. An exercise machine. An exercise machine, yeah, if you're feeling cooped up, <laughs> need, need access to exercise. Cleaning supplies and hand wipes. Cleaning mm -hmm. supplies right. and hand wipes, yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. It can not get any Lysol wipes anywhere. Still. Still, yeah, yeah. The Anything Zoom else? app. Oh, sorry, go ahead. The Zoom app. The Zoom app, yes. It would, maybe that could be the frame for the painting, one of like a Zoom window to keep it all, you know, <laughs> put it all that together. That would be clever, yes. A Zoom we'll have to window. work on this project. We'll, we'll have to see what we can do. <laughs> okay. Um, is any Kathleen last an artist? What's that? I was going to say, is Kathleen, are you an artist as well? No, just an art lover. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, if there's any artists among us, someone can volunteer to maybe make, to realize this commission for us. Yeah. <laughs> Art in the time of quarantine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, we'll okay. have to check the Ringling website. I think we have a little bit on there, right? That's true. Yeah, we've got people recreating paintings from home. They're very good. They're very creative. Um, okay, I want to move on to our, we have two more works to talk about. Um, they are actually not still lifes, but they are both part of Peter Paul Rubens' series, Triumph of the Eucharist. Um, so I want to start with this one. And so this was the painting that I asked you to prepare bread and wine. So I know some people have wine. I'm on the clock, so I've just got water in my goblet. Um, <laughs> if anyone is indulging in wine. Okay. Oh, and I see Betty and Jim, they've got some bread. Loaf no of bread. Wine. Too early for <laughs> bread. Wine. Does anyone have bread that they're proud of? Does anyone have homemade bread? Has anyone been no. doing some baking? Lately? Oh, good God, no. <laughs> I Never. will say, my husband has gotten into baking, so I've got a piece of uh, Sally Lunn bread that he made Ooh. this weekend, which is very Ooh. sweet and dense and delicious. Um, so happy. It's better than my tuna casserole from the last one. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say keep your husband at home, Laura. <laughs> I know. i got to just keep him, keep him working. Um, okay, so let's talk about this painting. Uh, I, I think maybe you've... you've, you've it's hard to miss if you spend any time in the re museum galleries. It's right when you walk in, right off the main lobby. Um, but take a look at it now. And what do you notice about this painting? What's going on in this painting? Spending some time just looking at all the details.
Abraham is being welcomed home. Okay, so you're identifying this figure here as, you know, this is Abraham, and uh, the painting is the meeting of Abraham and Melchizedek. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so he's being welcomed home, oops, sorry, uh, by this figure who is Melchizedek. Um, and what, 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 about, what about it made you say welcomed, Kay? What gestures of welcome or sense of welcome do you get from the choices here? They're giving them food. Okay. And possibly in those and wine. Wine. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so they're, they're sharing the food. So here's the chance to eat your bread, you know, and feel welcomed home like a returning war hero. If you take a bite of bread, mm -hmm. you can imagine you're Abraham, swarthily dressed here. Um, and then, yes, these huge um, vessels have wine in them. So we've got one here, one here, one here. And ostensibly, they're bringing them up from some sort of cellar or something, so more to come. So drink your wine now. There's plenty more where it came from. <laughs> So for you, that's interesting, Kate, because I know the importance of, of food in your life and sharing food. So <laughs> for the, the reason that you say he's being welcomed home is because he's being given food. I like that. Right. Well, yeah. we, we're always yeah, giving right. people food. <laughs> always giving people food. It, it, shows, it shows your love. Yeah. What else are you noticing about this painting? What other elements maybe you haven't noticed before? There's food above, too, with the pooties. Yeah. yeah, these garlands, these little swags, there's, I don't know exactly, it almost looks like a gourd and some grapes and some other food here, apples maybe, cherries. Yeah, food up there as well. Yes, but this here is what's in the back of the whole thing. Anything else that sort of strikes you as, as interesting or curious about this painting? Okay, well, I wanted to just share a little bit about the context, and I know some of you are familiar with um, this series, but I think it sort of bears reviewing because it's so complicated, and I know I have to return to it again and again. Um, so this is one painting um, from the Triumph of the Eucharist series painted by Peter Paul Rubens, um, and this is a series of paintings that are larger than life. If you've been in the galleries, and I assume most of you have, um, you, you know that they are incredibly massive. Um, and we have seven, or five of the remaining paintings. There are only seven in the world, so the other two are in France. Um, there originally were probably more, but they've since been destroyed. And these are a series of paintings um, that are meant to celebrate the, the Catholic rite of the Eucharist. Um, so I'm not Catholic, so if anyone is, feel free to jump in and correct me. But basically, it's the the what happens during the Mass when the blood and the uh, the blood, the bread and the wine are turned into the body and blood of Christ and are shared um, with people partaking in the Mass. So the bread and the wine here have this extra significance of also representing Christ's sacrifice for mankind. Um, so this this painting here, this exchange, this comes from, this is a scene from the Old Testament, so predating the life of Christ. Um, but basically, Abraham was uh, out on a, a military quest. He returns victorious. Um, these are all his, his soldiers and his men here. And I love this guy digging right into the bread. Clearly, he's hungry. <laughs> um, and... Uh, he he's sort of has this sh really significant exchange with Melchizedek. Now, Melchizedek was the priest king of Salem or Jerusalem. Um, and so he sort of prefigures the role of the priest in the Catholic Church. Um, and he's, he's giving this bread and this wine to Abraham. And, and sort of educated Catholic viewers at the time would have understood the significance that this, you know, prefigures or predicts or foretells um, the, the Eucharist, the rite of the Eucharist that will happen um, in Catholic Mass. So that's sort of it in a nutshell, but you can see how the bread and wine are incredibly significant to um, why the artist chose to depict this scene and the, the future significance for the entire Catholic faith. Questions or comments about that? Okay, I wanted to just point out one more thing about this too. And so um, when you sort of explore, read about the, the mystery of the Eucharist, um, it's this, these two worlds coming together, right? The divine world and the real world, and these boundaries are sort of blurred, and the, the real and the, the heavenly or the divine sort of become one in this moment when you participate in the Eucharist. And so the, the idea of worlds coming together, worlds blending, are really represented in this painting as well. So not only the world of Abraham and his men meeting the world of you know, Melchizedek and his attendants, but also look at the way that space is portrayed. So Agnes, you drew attention to these swags of garland here, these fruit, and they're held up by these little winged figures, these little puti, um, but it almost seems like it's a tapestry, right? And that's being rolled down. And if you follow it down, it seems like 
Abraham and his men are on the tapestry. They are represented on the tapestry and it comes down here again to the bottom. But then all of a sudden they're stepping out of that world into the world of Melchizedek where the tapestry sort of fades. The architecture becomes, seems more real in a sense. Um, and these men at the bottom carrying the wine are, seem to be emerging from some sort of real space. Um, so it's this really interesting and complicated thing that Rubens is doing throughout this series where he's blending these worlds together and sort of making it unclear what is real and what is maybe sort of fictive or just depicted um, on a two-dimensional plane. So I think it, it really, it bears closer looking when you are in the gallery to just sort of try to figure out what's going on with the space here and sort of trace it through. And it, it really can't be done, which I think is sort of the brilliant uh, sort of intent of the, of the painting. So that was me rambling quite a bit. I hope you all had plenty of time to eat your bread and drink your wine while I said that. Um, any other questions or comments about this before we move on to our last painting? Okay. So our last one, oops, and there's just the, I've got some close-ups. Oh yeah, I gotta, had to have the guy holding his wine protectively. We know that wine is a hot, hot commodity item. It was one of the things we're gonna put in our still life. So he just looks so, so protective of his wine. <laughs> And then again, I wanted to just sort of highlight uh, the exchange between the two, the really significant um, look as they, they understand the future significance of what's going on here. Close up of the bread for the bread lovers. Okay, so this is our last painting. And this is again in that same series. It's in the Triumph of the Eucharist series. It's in gallery two on display for you to see. Um, and as you look at this painting, what do you notice first? The column. And there's no right or wrong answer. I'm just curious kind of where your eye is drawn to when you first see Upward, this. drawn upward. Drawn upward. Okay, drawn and upward. why is that? Well, because of the hand gesture of the uh, gentleman on the right. Mm -hmm. And also the highest, uh, everyone's reaching up. The highest uh, mm -hmm. features are these baskets that are on the heads of the <coughs> women. And it's it just, and everyone is looking, pretty much looking upward except mm -hmm. down at the very bottom. Except for this guy here, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he kind of reminds me of the guy holding onto the wine. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, so everyone, there's a sense of sort of elevation, right? Your eye goes up to the top of the canvas. Everything is the, the reaching up, the hands, the, the baskets. Um, there seems to be a, an upward sense of movement. So for you, your eye goes up. What, anyone else, where, where does your eye go when you look at this painting? Oh, well, I'm the blue. The blue? The blue and the columns. The okay, so the, the blue background and these beautiful columns. Yeah. yeah, and so once again, we have this instance where there's this, you know, the blue background of what seems to be a tapestry um, mm -hmm. framed in this fictive architecture space. And I do have the, the actual frame of the painting is included in this image, so that is real, but these are painted columns. Um, so yeah, you have this framing of something where again, the boundaries between what is real and what is not is a little bit blurred. Um, and so, yeah, that's interesting to kind of bring it to the setting and, and how it's framed. And I think someone else was going to add something. The gold, especially her fabric and the columns. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The gold, yeah. So once again, that's everywhere. Of, all yeah, around. It's, it's so beautiful and so sort of luxurious in a sense. Um, and it's interesting because this story actually comes from Exodus. This is the gathering of the manna. Um, and this is meant to be the Israelites who had been wandering in the desert led by Moses, which is this figure here that we mentioned um, at the beginning, who's, you know, really draws our attention. Um, they're meant to be sort of starving and lost and destitute, uh, which you don't necessarily see here in the beautiful gold fabric and the very fleshy bodies, but that's Rubens taking some, art, you know, artistic license, so he can do that. Um, and so what has happened is they're sort of, you know, they're sort of at the end of their rope, they're asking God for salvation and then, um, in the morning, according to Exodus, uh, the manna from heaven fell down and they were able to gather it and it was this delicious food that sustained them and gave them life. So, you know, it's important for the series, The Triumph of the Eucharist, because this idea of manna or heavenly food sort of sustaining salvation or saving you um, goes back to that idea of the bread and the wine becoming the body and blood of Christ. Um, but also, uh, it's just a really, I think, really dynamic story and it really kind of fits in with the rest of the the paintings in the series um there's that motion there's that energy there's that up and down like you mentioned um and there's just this intense sort of feeling of 
gratitude on the part of Moses here, especially. Everyone else is sort of busy gathering the manna, um, and Moses is sort of, you know, raised his hand in a gesture of thanksgiving. So I saved this one for last because what food to you is heavenly? And I'm curious to hear what you've got today. And then have you ever had a dining experience that made you as grateful as Moses here, where you just <laughs> thought it was the best thing ever, whether it was the most, uh, you know, fancy meal you've ever had or the comfort food you needed just when you were having a hard time. Um, so I want to hear from you. And I see, Ed, are you holding up? Is that chocolate? That is chocolate. Chocolate <laughs> is the ultimate comfort food. Chocolate is the comfort food. I love that. Uh, oh, and Kate, what do you have? Food. It Honey. was a nice sort of uh, a fake Chinese uh, Ming uh, dish right here. Oh, perfect. So oh, you've got lovely. it even in a good setting that's appropriate for the other still lives we've talked right. about. So. And, and yeah, I should say, Kay, you've got your honey. Um, and I did say dessert or honey because it was described, if you, if you say, what, what does manna taste like? The general consensus is that it's like little wafers that taste like honey. So that very sweet taste. So I have honey too. You've got honey as well. Okay. I'm with Ed. I have chocolate. Chocolate. <laughs> we have pecan sandies. Not Ooh, so pecan great. sandies. Yeah. <laughs> okay for lunch. Yeah, cookies. <laughs> I've got a marshmallow myself because it seems to be sort of sort of like a bigger version. I should have had the mini ones, but those little pearls of manna falling from the sky, this sort of seems like the big version and it's sweet. <laughs> I don't know that it'll sustain me and bring me back from the brink of starvation, but uh, it's sweet. <laughs> what, what else? Who's, who's, ever had a, who's ever had an experience with food that made you, made you look like Moses here? Oh, many. Lots of them. <laughs> many, yeah, I was going to say the same thing. Lots yep. of them, yeah. <laughs> and not many of them, none of them cooked at home. None of them cooked at home, yes. <laughs> that is something I'm missing is going out to restaurants and having a really indulgent <laughs> dining experience. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll share something since Kay is at this gallery talk. <laughs> Kay, I have to tell you, every year my family looks forward to me receiving jambalaya mix from you. <laughs> Ooh. So it's, it's become an annual thing in my house around the holidays. So here's one for you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, well, I, that was the last painting. Oh, you know what? And I had some details for you. I always forget to show those. I'm sorry. So here's the, the information about the painting. And then it's, it's a little pixelated, but you can see how these sort of like pearl-like drops are falling from the sky being gathered in the baskets marshmallows if you will um, <laughs> oh, and then there we go so i'll end it there unless anyone has any other comments or questions or food related topics of conversation you'd like to pose that was great fun thank you thank you, <laughs> thank you, thank you for playing along with me i was afraid no one would bring any food to the talk and it would just be me holding up my plate but uh, it was fun to have you all participate <laughs>